Well, officially, good morning, and just to say thank you for allowing Renee and I to take some time away uh, to be uh, refreshed, and it was a redemptive uh, time away. Uh, let me put it that way. I, someone asked me today or said something that I have a lot to share today. Well, I'm not going to share today what so much we experienced on our sabbatical. Uh, what I am going to do is to tell you that on September the 8th, I'm beginning a brand new series and uh, about which I'm extremely excited. And on that day will be a state of the church message and kind of share with you what God has um, shared with me about this next season, this new frontier of ministry of the Yorktown Baptist Church. Again, I've been here 10 and a half years and looking forward to another 10 and a half and to see what God has to do as we trust Him, follow Him, and to love Him above all. And so we're, thank you for praying for Renee and I over these last few weeks while we were away. Again, it was a very redemptive time and look forward to sharing with you over the coming weeks again some of the things that God has has shared with us. What I'm going to do this morning or over the next three weeks before we begin a series, August the 4th called Training Camp, uh, I'm going to preach three standalone messages, independent messages that I preached before. Actually, these are kind of my favorites over the last 10 years, and so I'm going to pull these out of the hopper, if you will. Not that they're not just things that uh, I actually, I pray through this and, and think that this is a very timely message for today as well as the message that we have for the next two weeks. And so I just thought that in light of this past Thursday being Independence Day, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm guessing most of you were aware of that, that this was July the 4th, this past Thursday, that I would preach this message. Of course, on Independence Day, we, we uh, celebrate and remember our Declaration of Independence from an oppressive power longing to be free to govern ourselves. Did you know that it was seen, I don't know if you know this because historians are altering history now, but this was seen as an act of God, as a move of God, and a call of God in the hearts of our founding fathers that this would be America, this new country would be a city on a hill, a phrase that was actually used by the Puritans back in 1630 when they made their way to the new world. They believed that by living righteously according to God's design and desire and standard that they would be an example, imagine that, to the rest of the world. They would be this city on a hill. Yet in our third century, past the adoption of our Declaration of Independence, our culture, you know this to be true, we have moved dramatically away from the Judeo-Christian worldview from which our democracy was founded. I hope you believe that. Look at what some of the, if you don't believe that, go look at what some of the founding fathers wrote. I want to show you just a couple of three quotes here from them who believe this was an act of God. And the only way that a country can exist and sustain itself and be used by God is under the design and the, and the leadership of God. In a farewell address, President George Washington, September the 19th of 1796, he told the nation the following, look at this. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. John Adams. John Adams has a number of quotes concerning this, but he claimed the following. He said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of what? Christianity. Even Thomas Jefferson, whose faith Commitments have been the subject of much controversy. He insisted the following. Injustice in government undermines the foundations of a society. A nation, therefore, must take measures to encourage its members along the paths of what? Justice and morality. And what is happening in America today, though, is a, is a declaration of independence from God. That's what we're doing in the way that we're living as a nation, generally speaking. We're declaring our dependence or our independence from God because God, America has moved further and further away from God's design. And we find ourselves, I'm afraid, again, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet. I just see, based on history, at which we'll look here in a few minutes, I believe that we could be on the brink of God's judgment. Much like what has befallen other civilizations who have turned away from God and tempted and tested God beyond his mercy. In Jim Dennison's new book, it's a book that I read on sabbatical actually, called How Does God See America? By the way, if you're not a part of Jim Dennison's daily briefing, I encourage you to do that. He is one of the 
great thinkers when it comes to how Christianity aligns with culture and what we do as Christians to stand in the gap. So it's the Denison Forum. It's Jim Denison. But in his new book, How Does God See America? He shows throughout Scripture that God's judgment of a nation depends on answers to three questions. And here they are on the screen. Do they, the country, do they respect his truth? Do they respect each other? And do they respect him? And if you look throughout Scripture, whether it was Israel, God's people, or other pagan nations, the Lord cared deeply about the manner in which their way of life and their culture answered each of those three questions. And this hasn't changed. And while there is not an exact biblical criterion for when and how God will judge a nation, most of the Old Testament examples demonstrate that it falls, God's judgment falls, only after a warning comes from him. Beware. Behold. It was given through the Old Testament prophets, those spokespersons for God, who stood in the gap between God and man and would declare, thus saith the Lord. And today, God speaks directly to his people through the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And this doesn't mean that he will give every Christian a message for our nation, but it does mean that it is your your and my responsibility to speak on behalf of God to issues to the culture around us. And as we were up at the Vail Church in uh, two of the, the Sundays we were gone, the, the, the pastor there was talking about, well, it doesn't matter the context, but he said, you don't want to be a jerk for Jesus. We know a lot of those, don't we? They hammer truth. They're unloving. They're unkind. They're merciless. They're just mean. We're not to be a jerk for Jesus. We have to speak to cultural issues in the name of Jesus, in a loving, tender, compassionate, yet a bold manner. So, where is America in regards or with regards to God's judgment? Well, in most of the instances where the Bible records God's judging a nation, again, whether it's Israel or a pagan people, such punishment many times did not require an active role from him. It just kind of deteriorated that culture, that nation. He would step back to allow the natural progressions of events to take place as they move further and further uh, from God, even though he warned them this was going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. And lo and behold, they began to disintegrate. And in the story at which we're looking today, God actually took an active role in the judgment of this great and mighty empire. And also this past Sunday, the last Sunday in June, which is the first Sunday before the July 4th, Tony Perkins Organization, Family Research Council, which is a lobbying group for Christian values on our, in our capital, he has for the last several years set, a forth, set forth that day or set apart that day for a call to fall where he's asking Christians all over the country to get on their knees and to pray for our country. And I'll explain a little bit more of that in our response time. So that's where we're headed today. We're going to pray. We're going to cry out to God, actually, for our nation, for God's mercy on our nation and on us. So we're going to look at the story in Daniel chapter 5. You can go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel if you want to. You can go to the middle of the Bible, Psalms and Proverbs, and take a right. Then you'll see some prophets there, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Just so you'll know, as we enter the next year, I'm believe I'm going to be preaching a message from the, the book of Daniel about how to, how to live in a pagan nation, how, in, the, in these culture wars, in this culture, this clash of cultures, how do we live in a, in a pagan land? But let me give you the context of the story before we dive into Daniel chapter 5. 600 years before the birth of Jesus, the southern kingdom of Judah, remember there was the northern kingdom, Israel, the ten tribes. There were the two tribes to the south, Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem. And they were living in rebellion against God. You see this over and over through their history. And again, God sent prophets to warn them if they don't repent, if they don't turn back to God, God's going to bring about this judgment. It's in that period that we find Jeremiah the prophet who was standing in the gap. And he told them that they were going to be taken into captivity, into Babylon, this pagan nation, if they didn't turn back to God. And sure enough, in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was sacked, it was conquered, and God's people were taken into captivity to Babylon for 70 years, some five, 600 miles away from their homeland. And they were taken into captivity for 70 years, and that's what Jeremiah had prophesied. God judged his own people because of their rebellion against him. And several years later, 
Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, most scholars believe the, the king at this time at which we're looking was Belshazzar. He was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson who's now king, and so let's pick it up there. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand in honor of the Word of God. Can you, everyone standing, if you don't have your own Bible, you can direct your attention to the screen. I know some of you have already fallen asleep, so I just woke you up, and I want you to direct your attention to the screen as I read. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in, in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, he commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, really his grandfather, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them, and then they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And as the king saw the hand, or the king saw the hand as it wrote, then the king's color changed. You know what that means? <laughs> Got pale. All the blood is leaving his brain, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. You know what that means? He's scared to death. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom." Then all the king's wise men came in, but they couldn't read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was again greatly alarmed, his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, may you live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your grandfather the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, astrologers, because an excellent spirit, uh, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, to explain riddles, to solve problems were found in this man named Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Let's pray together. God, speak to us clearly, powerfully, loudly. God, may we take seriously the task at hand, what you've called us, the church, to be and to do. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I know you're thinking, well, that's a long introduction. Well, we got a little more to go. Years ago, Christian singer and songwriter Steve Camp wrote a song entitled Playing Marbles with Diamonds. Look at this quote, all, some of the lyrics on the screen. He says, we're waking up to a very different world. We got mud on our flag before it's even unfurled. Our heroes are falling and a leader is hard to find. Oh, the clock is running out, but we're casting our pearls before swine. There's a whole lot more than preaching to the choir, kneeling at the altar, or paying our tithe. We've been treating God like he's happiness for hire. We've been playing marbles with diamonds. The late J. Vernon McGee, who was a pastor and Bible commentator who you can still catch on some religious broadcasting stations, once told of a trip that he took to South Africa. As he was traveling through a small town, he saw a a group of boys clustered around a circle drawn in the dust at the side of the road. The famous preacher realized the boys were playing a game that he had played while he was gr growing up, a game of marbles. As McGee came closer, he noticed that the children had substituted small stones that were common in the area for the glass marbles that were so commonly used here in North America. As McGee continued to examine the stones, however, he realized that these weren't ordinary stones. They were what? Diamonds. The children had no idea the true value of those stones. They were treating the most precious stones in the world without regard for the true worth. They were playing marbles with diamonds. 
This morning we're going to see where the king of Babylon was playing marbles with diamonds and the destruction and the judgment of God that came as a result of that. We're probably, you probably heard someone use the phrase, well, I see the writing of the handwriting on the wall, which means it's a foregone conclusion that something's going to happen. It's a done deal. That, this story is from where we get that phrase, the handwriting on the wall. We're going to see what took place before King Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall and what we might expect before a final judgment, either as a nation, as a ruler, as a church, or as an individual. There have been many Christians who believe that God is going to judge America in the same way that he judged other nations throughout history. Some said if God doesn't judge America in some way, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Well, this is a great, exciting message on my first Sunday back on sabbatical, isn't it? Woo! God raised up, did you know God raised up Babylon for a purpose? That's what he said. I'm raising up Babylon. He called Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon. He's my lieutenant. I whistle and he does what I command him to do. And so God raised up Babylon for a purpose and then he judged it based on what we're going to see this very day. Now, I believe that God has raised up America. I believe that God has raised up Yorktown Baptist Church, don't you? And I believe that God has raised up you. Yeah, you, for a purpose. And I hope that you ha- if you haven't discovered that, then in the coming months and years, you will discover the good works that God has planned for you. But God has raised you up for a purpose. But we do not need to understand how we can fall under the judgment of God for the very reasons we see in this story. So, when you see the writing on the wall, again, it's a sign of judgment, of finality. And if you want to encounter the writing on the wall, again, these are all kind of negative points, which your homiletics professor tells you not to do. But I'm saying if you want to see the writing on the wall, if you want to incur God's wrath and God's judgment, then do these three things. First of all, desecrate that which is holy. If you want God's judgment and wrath on your life, the life of this church, on the life of this nation, then desecrate that which is holy. What does it mean to desecrate? Look at this on the screen. It's that you're diverting something from a sacred use to a profane use. Something that's been used for God's glory now to man's glory or profaning it, trashing it. Notice what Belshazzar did with those things that were, by the way, these were treasures from Jerusalem, the God of Israel's God. And notice what he did to these things that were consecrated to the Lord. Verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. These diamonds, this treasure that was dedicated and consecrated to the glory of God in the use of his temple, now they were parting with them, drinking wine, having a big time. Superstition was that a king didn't put sacred vessels to common use. And Belshazzar knew that this was a no no, but in his inebriated state, what happens? He lost his mind, and so he takes the treasure of God that his grandfather had stored years ago. He brings it out, and they start playing with them. They're playing marbles with, with diamonds. The drinking out of the temple vessels would be like taking the Ark of the Covenant, which was the manifest presence of God, putting it on a a card and and, uh, using it to haul children around a rodeo or a fair. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was that sacred piece of furniture that belonged in one place. Again, it was the glory of God. You, You see, you don't take lightly those things that are consecrated unto God, those things that are designated as holy. Again, this is a classic case of Belshazzar playing marbles with diamonds. Fast forward to verse 23 when Daniel finally arrives and explains everything. Look at verse 23. He says, the God, Yahweh, in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. What Daniel is saying, Belshazzar, you don't know that God, he owns your life. He gives you breath and you've not honored him. So your, your, your number is up. I believe that's what America is doing. We're playing marbles with diamonds, desecrating those things that God has declared as holy and mocking God, the God of heaven. I also believe that at times the church can collectively and individually play marbles with diamonds. And we have to be on guard for this, don't we? 
And we have to repent of, uh, of those things that would, which we have been guilty before being judged by God. Quickly, in what areas, and this is going to be the longest of these three points, so I know you're thinking, wow, if he spends that much time on the first point, we're going to be here for a while. No, we're not. So here's the first point. In what areas are some subpoints? In what areas might we as America be desecrating that which is holy, which is consecrated? Well, what about the institution of marriage? Marriage is a holy and sacred union designed and instituted by God, hear me, hear what the Bible says, as one man and one woman for life, period. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says about this. Hebrews chapter 13, the first part of verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all. But how have we taken this diamond of marriage and played it with, with it like a marble? Well, I think, first of all, by not taking the covenant of marriage seriously. People, into this, people many times enter into this relationship, and it doesn't work out a year or two, they're out. But we got to take seriously this, this sacred covenant of marriage that God has instituted, and God has ordained, that God will bless. Again, we talk about statistics with marriage. I'm not going to get into all of that, but... We need to elevate the seriousness of marriage and what God says about that. But not only has, again, we talk about divorce, lessening the sacredness of marriage, but same-sex marriage is now being very much accepted in this country. The Pew Research Center just recently found almost, tw- listen to this, twice as many evangelicals, people who believe in the gospel and believe that we ought to share the gospel, that's what an evangelical is. The Pew Research Center found almost twice as many evangelicals born after 1964 now support same-sex marriage when compared to those born before 1964. So when you, when you take the design of marriage that God has ordained, again, I don't have time to delve all into marriage, but I'm, you know what I'm talking about. This is a diamond that we're playing marbles with. When you take the design of marriage that God has ordained between one man and one woman for life and you distort it, pervert it, and diminish it, again, you're, you're messing around with those things that are holy. What, another, what is another holy area that we're des- desecrating and defiling? What about sex? Look at the latter part of that verse we just read, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. And let the marriage bed, and that really is one word in the Greek, and it's the physical act Sexual activity, that's what it is. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Again, this beautiful gift is given by God to one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage, period. That's God's design. That's the diamond. There are no exceptions, whether premarital or extramarital. The word sexually immoral in verse 4, that's one word in the Greek, it's the word pornos from where we get our word pornography. And you know as much as I do that pornography and adultery, but pornography now is a sin that is desecrating, denigrating the wonderful gift that God has given to married couples. And the statistics are overwhelming of those who are playing marbles with this diamond. Look at this on the screen. You've got a lot of statistics. Porn has gone mainstream. 67% of men, 59% of women say that pornography is acceptable. Look at these other statistics. More Christians now are struggling with this. We know based upon the Conquer series that we embraced a couple of semesters ago, Josh McDowell quotes statistics that 60% of Christian men are viewing porn. A Christian missions agency reports that 80% of new applicants admit to viewing porn, so they no longer ask them if you do it, but how often do you view it? One student pastor estimated that 90% of the kids who come to him for help, all who are from Christian families, are addicted to porn. 21% of Christian girls admitted to texting a sexually explicit picture of themselves. 50% of pastors regularly view pornography. Look at this. Pornography has exploded among our students. According to a worldwide survey of 19,000 parents, kids as young as age 6 are now accessing porn. The largest age group of porn users is 12 to 17 years old. 70% of 18 to 24-year-olds visit porn sites monthly. So we see marriage and families are being destroyed at an increasing rate. Estimates are that 50% of divorces are now caused by 
pornography? Is, this a, is, is the sex between a, a married man and a woman a diamond? Absolutely, but yet we're playing marbles with it, desecrating that which is holy. What other area are we playing marbles with diamonds quickly? What about life, the sanctity of life? Isn't God the one who gives and takes life? Whether through the termination of a life through abortion or euthanasia, we've come to look at life as something that is disposable as if we had the right to make that call. It's playing marbles with diamonds. Is it not? That baby in the womb, we, we got to see. <laughs> this is amazing. The first week of our sabbatical, we went and checked on all of our three boys to make sure they were actually employed in the jobs that they said they were employed. And so Micah, our youngest son, and his wife, they're pregnant. They're having a baby in December. And so while we were up there, us and Madison's, Micah's wife's parents, we got to go to the, see the sonogram, the first sonogram. And it was, it was cool because the doctor, who's actually, it wasn't a, an assistant, the doctor was actually doing the, the, uh, the uh, sonogram. And it was a brand new machine. And so he had to step out for the emergency. So we had about 20, 25 minutes in that room by ourselves. And Mike is over there with that thing, rubbing it over Madison's tummy, you know. And, and we're, we're looking at that. Did you know that that baby was two inches long and almost fully formed? The first words out of that, that, that baby's mouth was, I can't wait to see Papa Jay. That's what he said. I, right there, you could see it. I mean, that is a life, a life. It's a diamond, and we're playing marbles with it. What else are we desecrating which, that which is holy? What about the church of Jesus Christ? It's a diamond. We're treating, are we treating the church of Jesus Christ like a country club or a cruise ship, or do we believe that we are, as a church, as a local body, the Yorktown Baptist Church, we're engaged in a mission, in a movement, we're experiencing God. We're equipping each other. We're engaging our community. We're, we're extending the kingdom. We are reaching people to Christ, raising them up in Christ, and releasing them for the purposes of Christ. That's the mission. It's a diamond. We could go on and on about these things that we're desecrating. What about God's Word, the Bible? We call it a treasure. We've trashed it on the altar of tolerance and popularity. What about next? What about God's name, which is holy? We don't take the name of the Lord our God in vain and throw it around like any other four-letter word. Lastly, what about the gospel? That's a treasure, isn't it? That's a diamond, the gospel, that man can be reconciled, sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God through what Jesus alone did on the cross 2,000 years ago. That's the gospel, that you're saved by grace through faith, not through anything that you've done, no religious activity, no stack of works that you've done. You're saved by grace through faith alone, and now you're saved from, uh, from damnation, and you've been given this new life in Christ, this inheritance about which we talked a few, mo a few moments ago. That's the gospel that we still live by on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's not be... Let's, not, let, let's be careful not to desecrate those things which are holy by playing marbles with diamonds. Secondly, what else do we, in, we do? If you want to encounter the judgment of God, if you want to see the handwriting on the wall, which again is a sign of finality that it's, it's all over for you, then begin to deify that which is helpless. Deify that which is helpless. What do I mean? Look at verse 4. They, these thousands of in this banquet hall, they began to drink wine and praise the gods, little g gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stones. And we know that they are no gods at all. But they, but they worship them. They serve them and praise those gods. To deify something is to make it like a god, to worship and adore it. Not to so much get on your knees and to sing praise songs to it, but to Ascribe value to it, that your whole life now is dedicated to that God, to that idol. Everything you do, your mental capacities, your finances, everything is spent on that idol. And that idol, other than God, it can't help you. That's what it means to be helpless. It can't, it, it can't add any value to itself. It's helpless, but it can't help you. And we, we deify those things that are helpless. 
Later in the story, Daniel tells Belshazzar the, that these gods that you've created, they don't, they don't see, they don't hear, they don't know anything. Look at, so, uh, and then look at uh, what the, the psalmist said in Psalm 135, verses 15 through 18. The idols of the nations of silver and gold, the work of human hands. In other words, they're fashioning those. <laughs> they, have, they, they give them a mouth on that, but they can't speak. <laughs> they, they, they give them eyes, but they can't see anything. They give them ears, but they can't hear anything, nor is there any breath in their mouths. And those who make these idols, they become just like them, so do all who trust in them. Interesting, isn't it, that they are, uh, we're fashioning these very idols and they, 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 they can't help us. These gods that we're crafting, they can't provide any assistance to us. We deify that which is helpless. Look at what God said through the prophet Jeremiah about, again, Judah prior to their exile into Babylon. Again, this is a warning that came from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2 verse 11, has a nation, has this nation, have you, have you changed your gods? even though there are really no gods at all. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Is that not what America has done, changing its God? Is that not what some of us may be doing? Deifying that which can't help us? Government? We deifying government, people, we deifying religion and rules, are we deifying sports, are we worshiping those things that become idols? Our work, again, those things are helpless when it comes to eternal matters. So I just want to say, let us be deliberate to exalt and to worship and to bring glory to the one true God. Amen. What else might we do before experiencing God's judgment, before we see the handwriting on the wall? Here it is. Go ahead and dismiss all the lessons that you learned from history. Just dismiss that. Excuse it away. Justify it. Again, we don't have time to read all of it, but in verses 18 through 21, Daniel recounts the the 30-year-old story of Nebuchadnezzar and how God positioned him. God gave him that that power and that grandeur and that territory and that rulership. But how Nebuchadnezzar one day was on the walls of this mighty palace of Babylon and said, look at what I've done. Look at what my hand has brought about. And instantaneously he was judged and he spent seven years crawling around like an animal until he came to his senses. And in ver- and Belshazzar, th- this was a story everybody in Babylon knew, recorded ad infinitum. And then in verses 22 and 23, look at what Daniel says. And you, his son, his ancestor, his grandson, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. But you have lifted up yourself against the God of heaven, the God in whose hand is your very breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Daniel tells Belshazzar, you knew this about your grandfather. You, You think you would have known better that not to be arrogant but to humble yourself before this, this God. Perhaps Belshazzar think that something like happened to his grandfather could never happen to him. He was defiant before God. And when it comes to America, shouldn't we heed the lessons that we learn throughout history of the world or throughout the history of this country? The lesson is that a nation who forsakes God and plays marbles with diamonds is destroyed either externally or internally. A nation who turns from God will have their wish. No power, no presence of God, and certainly not his protection. Interestingly, in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul, when writing to this Corinthian church about when Moses led the, the children of Israel out of Egypt and what they experienced as a result of God's favor. Here's what they did. Just, we just want you to remember that is what he's saying. But then in verses 5 and 6 of 1 Corinthians 10, look at what he says. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place, what, as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And the things that he delineates, the things that they pursued were idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God, and grumbling. 
So what is Paul saying? Hey, you need, to, you need to learn what happened to God's people just some years ago so that you might not turn to that. So are, are we learning anything, you and I, individually? Are we learning anything from other family members? Are we learning anything from news stories that we read? Are we, lear- are, are we learning anything to say, I'm not going there anymore? Again, don't dismiss those things because you think that you're above any pain or judgment. So what happened as a result of, of all that led up to this point? Well, Daniel reveals what the writing on the wall means. He's the only man in the kingdom who can read it and then interpret it. Look at this. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God talking about Belshazzar, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Your time's up. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. You've not measured up, Belshazzar. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the uh, the Medes and the Persians. And it says that very night, verse 30, that very night Belshazzar the Chaldean, the Babylonian king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. See, what we don't read in this story, but we know from history, that very night that Belshazzar is holding this banquet and bringing out the treasury of Yahweh God back in Jerusalem, bringing it out in Babylon to toy with it, the Medes and the Persians, another empire, they're outside the city, the massive city walls. Belshazzar was so arrogant that he didn't take measures, protective measures. He thought that it was impenetrable and formidable. But the Medes and the Persians, as you know, the Euphrates Rivers goes right through the, uh, the city of Babylon. And so they dammed it up stream and, and, and uh, directed, deterred the, the, the flow of water into a marsh. So the water level of the river began to get shallower and shallower to where the troops of Medes and the Persians went down the river under the wall of Babylon and overthrew it. That was October the 12th, 539 B.C. Again, Belshazzar was executed only a few hours after they had gone through the city walls. I think sometimes America or a church or an individual become so arrogant, careless that they think that they're above judgment or destruction. I don't know where you are right now in your walk. I know where America is, not in relationship to God's judgment, but in relationship to God's design. Uh, And I don't know about you, but when I read the news, I can get very discouraged, almost depressed, thinking, God, who am I to stand in the gap? But God has called us individually and collectively to be a voice, to to penetrate people that you and I know locally, to engage them with the gospel, to love them. Again, not being a jerk for Jesus, but speaking with grace, compassion. But if you're here this morning and you see yourself committing all of these things, you're desecrating that which is holy, you're, uh, yeah, you're deifying that which is helpless, you're dim- dismissing all the, the lessons from history, s- stop. Don't think that you're above God's judgment and wrath. Don't think that God is just holding out for you and saying, please, please. It's his kindness, the Bible said, that even brings you to repent because he loves you. It's his steadfast love. So I don't know where you are in your walk with Christ, but repent, which means what? Stop. Don't quit heading this direction. Turn around and run into the arms of a loving God who will embrace you. He won't shun you. He won't say, now, I got you where I want you. No, he will embrace you. So I have no idea where you are in your walk with Christ, but today could be a a day uh, that could be the, the, really the first day, I hate to use this, but the first day of the rest of an incredible life for you. So don't waste this opportunity that God has given you while you're here. Don't experience that writing on the wall to where you realize this event, it's all over for me. Every year for the last few years, again, as I said, the The Family Research Council has set aside this Sunday 
to call Christians to get on their knees begging God to stir hearts. And again, this past Sunday was that Sunday, but since I was out and I'm preaching this message today, I just think it's appropriate that we, we confess our dependence upon God. One of my friends has said that prayerlessness is, is, a, is a declaration of our independence from God. God, we don't need you. We don't believe that you can do anything. And while we gripe about not being able to have prayer in schools and prayer in public places, when's the last time you prayed in your home fervently for this country instead of griping about it? Although prayer may be removed from the White House, the schoolhouse, the courthouse, what about our house? What about this house? The Bible says that my house, Jesus is my house, should be called a house of prayer for all the nations. So this morning in a few moments we're joining with Christ's followers to confess again our dependence upon God and for God to have mercy on our, our nation. Again, we agonize over the condition of our country, but are we agonizing maybe over the condition of our own hearts, <clears throat> maybe churches? I, I, I hope you believe that we need some kind of reviving, refreshing, some kind of spiritual awakening in our churches, and that's what I long for. To let God be my, to, to let Jesus be my greatest treasure, to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what I long for. And we need that among the God's people to, to have a passion for Him, to have a, a spiritual awakening. We used to call it a revival. But that's what it is it's a reviving. As, as King David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Maybe some of you need that today. And you need to take steps to repent of those things that you know are deterring your passion. And then all of a sudden, your heart is turned to right to God. When you exalt Him and begin to read about Him and pray to Him and love Him, then it becomes your, your passion, your treasure. So we need, you, you, you may need a spiritual awakening, a reviving in your own spirit and your own soul. Look at this, and then we're going we're gonna to spend some time praying. Look at this on the screen. If all the sleeping people will wake up, if all the lukewarm people will fire up, if all the dishonest people will confess up, if all the disgruntled people will cheer up, if all the estranged people will make up, if all the gossipers will shut up, if all true soldiers will stand up, if all the dry bones, again, referring to a story in Ezekiel, if all the dry bones will shake up, if all the church will, people will pray up, then perhaps we can have a revival. And we need it, do we not? I read this proverb recently that reminded me the need to live according to God's design, Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness does what? It, it exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And then look at Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous increase, and some translations use the word rule there, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. We know that to be true, do we not? So, would you join with me in begging our loving, gracious, merciful God to have mercy on our country, to stir hearts, to use us in some capacity if you will put yourself in a position to be used, say, God, I'm, I want to be used. So if it's physically, I'm going to ask some of you to come to the altar, but if it's physically possible for you, I'm going to ask you to get on your knees. Just get up, turn around at your chair, get on your knees, and we're going to spend a few minutes praying for our country. So go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to count to three. Just get up, turn around, get on your knees. Some of you can come to the altar. That's more comfortable, more appropriate. I was thinking about what would be an appropriate prayer, and you can go online and find a lot of prayers, but I, I thought, you know, what about Daniel's prayer for God's people who were in Babylon as they were living in exile, separated from their homeland? So what I'm going to pray is a variation of that prayer that Daniel prayed for his people. So let's, let's, let's pray together. You just agree with me, or you can pray on your own. Oh, Lord, you are great and awesome God. And you always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and we've done wrong. 
We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets who spoke on your authority, to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right, but as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we are, and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing His truth. O oh Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power, but we have sinned and we're full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your people. All the neighboring nations are mocking us and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. So, O oh our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. And so we make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. So, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. O oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. And so, God, we cry out that for our church, for this city, for this nation. God, that you would suspend your judgment as we work to to share the gospel, to be the light in the darkness, to proclaim the excellencies of who, you who has called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. So God, give us another day. Give us another hour. God, give us the opportunity. Let us be bold and courageous to, to be spokespersons for you, lovingly, compassionately, yet boldly. Stir the hearts of your people to repent and run to you. Stir the hearts of people in authority to honor you. So God, have mercy on this great nation. Have mercy on this church. Have mercy on us. God, bring renewing and reviving an awakening to your people. God, let it begin here as we yield to you. We love you, God. Thank you for the inheritance that you've given us that nobody can take away. And we all, God, pray this. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord and our greatest treasure. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. God bless you. I'll ask everybody to go ahead and stand. We're, go, everybody stand. I'm going to ask our pastors and elders just to kind of hang around here at the front. We'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you, to maybe help you process what you believe God is doing in your, your spirit right now. But it's, uh, it's good to be back. I love my church family. Love them. Thankful for you. Let's pray one more time. God, use us. Thank you for what you're doing. Protect your church for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.